Hey guys, for those of you who want a short summary, we're launching an investing app centered around treasuries and bonds called Silo. We've been working on this app for the past 20 months and we're really excited for you guys to see it. We're starting by letting friends and family into the app and we're hoping to start letting people off the waitlist by the end of this year. If you would like to be one of the first people to get access to Silo, please consider joining our waitlist below. For those of you who want to know more, let me explain. Silo is an investing platform that is looking to bring the 21st century to the underappreciated market of bonds. If you're looking to invest in bonds on any existing platform, whether it be Fidelity, Schwab, or TD Ameritrade, you'll probably be greeted with a table that looks like this. You have an assortment of maturity dates and bond types, but you don't really get any information about who the issuers are, what other bonds they offer, or any bond-specific characteristics. And if you click on one of these table entries, you're taken to a page like this, where you just see a massive list of every single bond on the market that fits that given category. I would imagine that this is rather overwhelming for someone who is trying to invest in bonds for the first time. And that's why we wanted to build an experience that prioritizes the ease of finding and investing in issuers that you already know and trust. For example, let's say I wanted to invest in an Apple bond. I can navigate to the search tab, look up Apple, and get a list of all Apple bonds sorted by maturity. You can also sort by yield, coupon rate, or our custom suitability score. For every bond in the app, we use your investment goals and profile to create a personalized suitability score. This Apple bond, for example, has a suitability score of 89 and a yield to maturity of 5.317%. We can use a slider here to estimate how much we would earn on a daily, monthly, or annual basis at the current yield. And if we scroll down, we have all of the bond-specific characteristics. Speaking of bond characteristics, if you don't have a specific issuer in mind, you can navigate over to the Explore tab, which by default pulls up the 5 bonds that best match your investment profile and goals, but you can further refine the search. For example, let's say I'm looking for a corporate investment grade bond that's yielding at least 7.5%. If I press filter, I'll get a list of bonds that meet my requirements sorted by suitability. Um, let's look for an issuer that we recognize. Here's one, Paramount Global. It looks like this Paramount Global Bond has a yield of 7.836% and a suitability score of 81. If I wanted to invest $10,000 into this bond, I can just use this slider and then press Earn. From here, I can adjust any of the order settings I want. For example, let's say I want the order to fill as quickly as possible. Then I would want to switch the order type to Market. And then if I press Submit, it'll ask me to authorize using Face ID. And let's give it a second. And boom, the order is submitted. Now, if I navigate to the History tab, we can see that this order has been placed and it looks like it's already been filled as well. So if I navigate over to the Portfolio tab and refresh, then we can see that we have a new issuer, Paramount Global, and here's all the details about our position. If I want to sell, I can do the exact same thing. I can just press Sell, change the order type to Market, and then I can press Submit. Face ID authorization, and boom, the order is submitted. If I go to history, you can see the sell order, it's already been filled. And if I go back to portfolio and refresh, you can see that the Paramount position is now empty. Lastly, you have your profile page where you have general housekeeping stuff like statements, settings, profile, and stuff like that. So that was kind of a general overview of Silo, and I hope you would agree that it's far friendlier to use than what's already out there. But that's not why we created Silo. Let me explain. The main reason that we started developing Silo is because an entire generation of investors are being left behind, millennials. In fact, on average, millennials tend to hold 65% of their assets in cash, the highest of any generation despite being the youngest. It's easy to write this off as irresponsible millennials who are too busy ordering DoorDash instead of focusing on investing and their financial future. But there's actually a much darker factor at play the 2008 financial crisis. The 2008 financial crisis affected everyone. Millions of people lost their jobs, their homes, and everything they ever worked for, while big banks and irresponsible corporations got to walk away with massive bailouts. Wells Fargo, $25 billion. JP Morgan Chase, $25 billion. Citigroup, another $25 billion, and those are just the banks. 
GE walked away with a $140 billion bailout, and AIG walked away with a $182 billion bailout. Once again, the real culprits had walked away scot-free while it was the everyday American that was left behind. But despite how painful this was, most Americans did work through this. They eventually got new jobs, new houses, and built up new life savings. Everyone except for millennials. Ironically, millennials had lost the least amount of money given that they were all young adults with no money to lose. But while they didn't lose money, they had lost something much deeper, a part of the American dream. They had seen their parents and people around them lose everything and it gave them a rather cynical view of capitalism. They felt that there was no reason to be loyal to a company, no reason to idolize rich people, and definitely no reason to invest given that Wall Street would just stack the cards against them. 15 years later, these fears are still very much alive. In fact, a whopping 80% of millennials admit that the crisis still influences their investing to this day. And this is largely why they tend to hoard cash. In fact, nearly 1 in 4 millennials have savings of $100,000 or more, yet stock market participation is still lower than it was 23 years ago. Several new age investing companies have tried to address this. On the stock side of things, you've got people like Robinhood, Webull, Public.com, Moomoo, and M1 Finance. And on the crypto side of things, you've got people like Coinbase, Binance, and till recently a lot more. But while these guys have increased market participation, I don't think they've necessarily increased investing participation, given that these guys aren't exactly encouraging people to invest. Rather, they're encouraging people to trade stocks and options or 10x their money with crypto and NFTs. Much of their pitch is trying to make investing fun and exciting, but the reality is that investing should not be exhilarating. If it is, you're probably gambling, not investing. Of course, you'll always hear about some random guy who made millions by betting on some obscure stock or crypto, but chances are you probably won't be turning $1,000 into a million by trading you're actually more likely to lose the initial 1,000. Why do platforms sell this vision then, you ask? Well, two reasons. For one, untold riches is the easiest way to get people to open accounts and deposit money. And two, traders generate far more commissions than buy and hold investors. And as such, we've seen this massive gamification of the entire investing space. Real investing, however, isn't about making millions overnight. Real investing is about making responsible and calculated moves to grow wealth over an entire lifetime. And this is what we would like to bring to market with Silo. Long term, we would like to offer much more than just bonds, but we decided to start with bonds because it's by far the most underappreciated and underserved asset class, especially when it comes to everyday investors. You see, all of the biggest companies and investors in the world own hundreds of billions of dollars worth of bonds. Take Apple for instance, they're currently holding $34 billion in short-term marketable securities and $104 billion in long-term marketable securities, most of which is bills and bonds. Similarly, Microsoft is holding $144 billion in cash, cash equivalents, and short-term investments. Even Warren Buffett, the legendary stock investor, is playing with $100 billion worth of treasury bills. All of this is only a mere fraction of the entire bond market though. The global bond market is worth $133 trillion, which is even larger than the global stock market, which is only worth $109 trillion. But despite the raw size and ubiquity of bonds, the everyday investor has only heard about bonds in passing. So what even are bonds? Well, before we get into all the technical details, let's take a step back and understand the role you play in the bond market. As individual investors, we get the unique opportunity to help large companies and our government raise money. These institutions really only have two main ways they can raise money, sell parts of their company or get a loan. When they sell a part of the company, you're able to buy a piece of it through the stock market. And if you're the average millennial, you're probably not the biggest fan of stock investing because you saw what happened in 2008. Any company could very well crash and burn, rendering their stock completely useless. After all, didn't Amazon themselves lose money for a decade? So all of that might sound a bit too risky, and you're not wrong. Investing in individual stocks can not only be risky, but unpredictable. 
But with that being said, this risk also comes along with a substantial amount of upside potential. If you're just looking for a stable, reliable investment that pays out a set amount though, this may be where bonds could be of value. Instead of buying a piece of the company with the bonds, you lend it to the company under a legally binding contract. And if they don't pay you back, a bunch of lawyers would knock down their door and sell everything they have left and pay you back as much as possible. When a company agrees to this arrangement, they're agreeing to raise debt, otherwise known as issuing bonds. And these very bonds are available for us to purchase, however, they work a bit differently than stocks. For starters, the most basic characteristic of a bond is its face value. This is usually $8,000, and it's the amount of money that the company is promising to pay you back. This doesn't mean that you'll always buy a bond at its face value though. Oftentimes, the market price of a bond will be lower than its face value. For example, an Apple bond with a face value of 1000 may be trading at 950 This means that you only have to pay 950 to purchase this bond, but Apple will pay you back 1000 when the bond matures. If the bond's maturity is one year out, you'll earn a profit of $50 at the end of the year, which translates to roughly a 5% yield. In the meantime, most bonds will also pay out interest payments known as coupon payments. A coupon payment is a percentage of the face value that gets paid out usually twice a year. For example, let's say that same Apple bond had a coupon rate of 2%. In this scenario, on top of the $50 that you already earned, you would earn another $20 in the form of coupon payments. AKA, your total profit from the bond would be $70, meaning that your total yield would be roughly 7%. Of course, you could really get into the weeds of this with call dates and accrued interest, but in a general sense, that's how bonds work. You lend a company a bit of money, they pay you some interest for it, and once the contract is over, they pay you back the full amount and go about their business. But how safe really is all of this? One of the biggest pros of bonds is their consistency and reliability. Since there is a legal obligation for the lender to pay you back, failure to make these timely payments puts lenders in default. And just like how us individuals have credit ratings that measure how financially responsible we are, companies have credit ratings of their own that measure the likelihood of default. These ratings are split up into two categories, investment grade and high yield or junk. Investment grade is obviously the safer of the two. In fact, in 14 of the past 22 years, investment grade corporate bonds did not default at all. Also, about junk bonds, these definitely have a scary name and we wouldn't personally recommend these, but all things considered, they're actually rather safe as well. Even with all of the pressures of high inflation and high interest rates for example, as of June, the high yield bond default rate was still only 1.9%, which just goes to show how seriously companies take paying back bondholders. On Silo, there's over 2,000 corporate issuers that you can choose from, but if you're really concerned about minimizing risk, your best bet would likely be government bills and bonds. The federal government's bonds, aka treasuries, work the same way as any other bond. However, because it's the government that's issuing them, they are seen as some of the safest investments available. Now, let me preface by saying that there is no such thing as a risk-free investment. All investments carry risk, that's kind of why they generate a return in the first place. But in the spectrum of risk, US government bonds are as close as you're gonna get when it comes to eliminating risk. In fact, the only time that a financial institution is allowed to describe a return as risk-free is when they're referring to treasury yields. Treasury yields are considered risk-free because they're backed by the US federal government, who in theory can just print money to pay back bondholders. When it comes to safety and security though, the investment itself only tells half the story. The platform through which you invest is also equally important, and that's why we're proud to say that each silo account is protected by $500,000 in SIPC insurance and $2.5 million in FTIC insurance. Also, all funds deposited on the platform will be maintained by our trusted custodian, Interactive Brokers, who has experience managing $373 billion worth of assets over the past 45 years. So with Silo, you're not only getting the sleek UI and friendly interface of a modern investing platform, but you also get the experience and stability of an established brokerage. All of that probably sounds nice and all, but you're probably wondering, how much will all of this cost?
while we'd love for as many of y'all to use the platform as possible, we think there is a certain group of people who would benefit the most from Silo. After all, bonds are just one asset class, and many investors would benefit more from other investments, whether that be stocks, real estate, indexes, or simply holding cash. In today's environment, high-yield savings accounts are yielding up to 5%, meaning that holding cash itself could be a great option. But what about the cash that isn't growing? Maybe you have it in a Chase or Wells Fargo account. Big banks are notorious for handing out fractional interest rates on your cash. So if you're someone that's holding cash that isn't benefiting from the high interest rate environment, or worse, getting eaten up by high inflation, a good alternative is holding short-term treasuries that provide rates as high as 5.5%. Also, if you've stockpiled a bunch of cash into a high-yield savings account, one downside you should consider is that high interest rate savings accounts only last as long as the Fed keeps interest rates high. In one, two, or a few years from now, decreases in interest rates will send high yield savings rates back to the bottom. So if you don't want to play that game and just want to lock in a rate for the next decade or further, 10 or 30 year treasuries or even long term corporate bonds may make sense. Ironically, this strategy may apply to the other side as well. For example, let's say you're heavily invested in stocks and are seeing that your returns over the past year haven't been that great or you just want to reduce volatility. Well then, it may be time to diversify. Investing in bonds at these rates means earning much more consistent and secure income that has even matched stock market performance over the past year. Also, what about real estate? With mortgage rates at levels past 8%, it may make more sense to earn 5% through bonds than pay 8% on a property. Now, a lot of these have to do with the current condition of our economy. But one type of investor that may benefit from bond investing regardless of current conditions is a more conservative investor who has some level of apprehension toward stocks. Maybe you see stocks as too risky, unpredictable, and volatile, but also feel that you should be doing some sort of investing. In this case, bonds could be the perfect middle ground for you. Sure, they won't have the same return potential as stocks, but it may be a more comfortable investment. As you can see, bonds can be a valuable asset to a wide range of investors, but to be honest, there's a lot of people for whom bonds are not the right choice as well. Likely the most obvious group of people for whom Silo would not be a good fit for is if you're not able to invest at least $5,000 or ideally at least $10,000. For one, the monthly fee would eat into a lot of your returns, but even putting that aside, bonds in general probably aren't a great fit for you. For example, let's say you invest $1,000. Even if you lock in an 8% yield, you're only earning $80 per year, which brings up the question of whether that's even worthwhile. It's only when you get into the tens of thousands of dollars that bond yields really start to add up. Also, if you're not in a position where you can invest five or $10,000, it would probably be a better idea to build up larger cash reserves and an emergency fund before investing in anything. Someone else that bonds may not be a good fit for is someone who already has a solid investing plan in place and investing in bonds would take away from that. For example, maybe you already invest everything you're comfortable with investing into the S&P 500 every month. You should not start investing in bonds if it would take away from this existing plan. In other words, bond investing should be something that you add to your investing strategy, not something that replaces your existing strategy. Bonds would also not be a good fit for you if you have a high risk tolerance and are looking for high returns. The truth is that even if you're investing in the highest yielding junk bonds, you won't be generating 5 or 10x returns. So if that's what you're looking for and you're willing to take the risk, stocks and crypto would probably be a better option. Also, speaking of returns, since bonds pay a fixed interest rate, there is really no compounding effect. When you try to reinvest your coupon payments, there is no guarantee that bond yields will be at the same level as when you originally invested. For example, a 30-year treasury bond today yields around 5%. But 10 years down the line, if 30-year treasuries are only yielding 3%, you wouldn't be able to reinvest the interest payments at the same 5% yield. So if you want a single avenue to invest in and see your portfolio compound, index funds, ETFs, and mutual funds may make more sense. Silo would probably also not be a good fit for you if you have cash but can't afford to lock it up for a set period of time. AKA, if you have a high need for liquidity, investing in bonds is not the right choice for you. Rather, it would make more sense to keep your money in a high yield savings account without a lock-in period so that you can withdraw at any time. 
Honestly, this is starting to sound like one of those disclaimers at the end of a medicine commercial. So let's move on. At the end of the day, high inflation and high interest rates have led us into an environment that we haven't seen since really the 1970s. As such, the value proposition of every asset class has drastically changed and the asset class that likely benefited the most is fixed income. Of course, we're biased, but we truly believe that we have created a stellar bond investing platform that redefines how retail investors are able to invest in bonds. And by choosing Silo, you would be choosing transparency, ease of use, and most importantly, a wide selection of secure and consistent investments. So if you're in the market for something like that, please consider checking out Silo in the description below. If that doesn't really apply to you, we completely understand and appreciate you watching the entire video anyway. If you would like to learn about how Microsoft conquered the coding world, check out this video. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.